Hi, I'm Professor David Atley, and this is Topics in Astronomy. Thanks for joining me. In this video, we'll be talking about the nebular hypothesis, which is our idea for how planets form within our own solar system. We'll talk a little bit about some of the observational evidence about our solar system that motivates this hypothesis, and then run through the planet formation process itself. Let's get started. First, let's quickly remember everything contained within our own solar system. The biggest and by far the most dominant thing in our solar system is the Sun, and it's accompanied by eight major planets along with a collection of dwarf planets and innumerable asteroids and comets. When we look at all of these contents, we see some important patterns start to show up. For example, we see that planets can be divided into terrestrial and Jovian groups. The terrestrial planets are rocky planets like the Earth, so they're small, dense, etc. Whereas the Jovian planets, sometimes called the gas giants, are planets like Jupiter. That includes Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, which you see pictured across the bottom of the slide along with the Earth to give you some scale. And if we compare these two groups of planets, we can notice some important patterns. Uh, for example, the terrestrial rocky planets are close to the Sun, whereas the Jovian planets are far from the Sun. The Jovian planets are large in radius, have big masses, and of course Saturn at least has a pretty prominent ring system. Along with the visual patterns that we noticed on the previous slide, we can also realize, for example, that the terrestrial planets ought to be hotter and denser than the Jovian planets. Hotter because they're closer to the Sun, and denser because they're made of rock instead of gas. We can also look at the planets from the Earth, and we notice another important feature of the solar system that we're going to have to be able to explain whenever we develop a hypothesis of planet formation. If you look across the bottom of the slide, you'll see an image from the planetarium simulator Stellarium showing three of the planets, four if you count the Earth, plus the Moon, and the four of those that sit in the sky all line up nicely along that red curve. That red curve marks the ecliptic. And this is always true for planets. Any planet that you find in the sky is going to be found on or very near to the ecliptic path. And the reason for that is that the planetary orbits in our solar system all orbit basically in the same plane. So the planetary orbits more or less line up. That order is also reflected in the relatively orderly behavior of the orbits themselves. So each of the planets is more or less concentric with the Sun. There's no significant crossing of planetary orbits. Pluto's weird. Remember, Pluto's not really a planet. And then we see this separation of different types of debris, like asteroids versus comets, into different regions in the solar system, isolated by different planetary orbits. So most of the asteroids, for example, are found between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. We also see some regular patterns, one of which is called Bode's Law, this idea that the sizes of planetary orbits follows a nice mathematical progression. This turns out just to be an accident, but it was one of the early clues that there seems to have been some sort of regularity going on driving the structure of the solar system. And while we see many patterns like the ones that I've identified, there are unique features to each planet within the solar system. Um, for example, if we look at the planet Uranus, instead of rotating with its north pole pointing up, as most of the planets in the solar system do, instead Uranus orbits on its side. So its north pole is in the plane of its orbit. That's weird. So we need to be able to explain that weirdness. Similarly, the Earth has an extremely large moon 
given its overall mass. Earth's moon is one of the largest in the solar system, comparable in size to the moons of Jupiter, whereas the Earth itself has less than one three hundredth of Jupiter's mass. So this is also weird, and we need to be able to explain that as well. So we need to have a system that creates regular order, but still leaves enough freedom to create some of these oddities that mark each planet off from the rest. So any theory we develop for planet formation has to be able to explain all of those observed things that we've been talking about. So the sizes of planetary orbits. Planets are tiny compared to the distances between them. The sizes of the orbits goes up as you work your way out from the sun. The terrestrial and Jovian planets are separate from one another. They don't mix. Terrestrial are close to the sun. Jovian are far from the sun. We see all of the planets orbit close to the ecliptic, but we also have some variety and we need to be able to explain all of that simultaneously with whatever idea of planet formation we develop. Our current working hypothesis for how planet formation happens is what we call the nebular hypothesis. It's the idea that planets form and star systems, so planets and stars form together, out of a collection of cold interstellar gas. So you have this big lump of gas in between the stars, that's what interstellar gas means, just gas between the stars. And some of that gas begins to collapse under the influence of its own gravity. You can see a location relatively nearby to the Earth where this is happening on the left-hand side of the slide. Um, the big image is a photograph of the Orion Nebula, which is part of the Orion Molecular Cloud Complex. And then you see a couple of insets across the bottom of the image showing places where stars and planets are actively forming. Um, so there are stars in the middle of those flat, dark disks, and those disks contain lots of gas and dust, and that's where we think planet formation is happening. And over the next few minutes, I'll talk to you about how that process, we think, proceeds. In the nebular hypothesis, we start with this big cloud of gas, that's then shrinking under the influence of its own gravity. And as it's shrinking, it starts to rotate faster and faster and faster. This is due to a phenomenon in physics that we call the conservation of angular momentum. Angular momentum can have some interesting effects if it's applied correctly. For example, it can be really important for figure skaters when they go into turns. Watch what happens as I adjust the position of these weights while I'm spinning. So as the weights come in, I spin faster, and when the weights go out, I spin slower again. Let's try that one more time. Just like me spinning on a chair, as I pull mass in and start spinning faster, as the cloud pulls its mass in, the cloud starts to spin faster too. So any tiny random initial rotation gets magnified as the cloud collapses. And if you've ever been to an old school pizzeria where the guys stretching the dough like to show off, they'll throw it up in the air and spin it around. Why do they do that? They do that because the spinning action forces the dough into a disc. It flattens the dough out, gives you a nice thin pizza crust, and gives you that New York crunch. The same thing happens to the gas and the dust in the disc. As the disc, as the cloud starts to rotate faster, it forces all of that gas and dust out into a disc-like shape. And then we end up with what's called a protoplanetary disc, like the one you see depicted on panel two. And within that protoplanetary disk, we're going to form planets. So we have to take all of that gas and dust and somehow get it to coalesce into the planets that we see in our solar system today. And we do that by taking 
small objects, so initially things like the size of a grain of sand or maybe even a little smaller, and through successive collisions, build up larger and larger structures in a process that we call core accretion. There are a number of important stages in this core accretion process that we've labeled and mark off different physical processes relevant to the growth behavior of those stages. We call those stages clump, planetesimal, and protoplanet. So let's take each one of those in turn. So we start out with our clumps. Clumps are like rocks or grains of sand or something like that. In general, they're less than about one kilometer in size, and really they're just rocks. If you want to grow a clump, the only way to do it is to have it just randomly, by dumb luck, smash into another clump and have them stick. But eventually, after you wait for a while and you let them stick and grow and stick and grow and stick and grow, you eventually get to a large enough size, greater than about one kilometer, to reach the next stage. That's the planetesimal stage. And a planetesimal is between about one and about a thousand kilometers in size. And you can see an example of a planetesimal left over in our solar system today, pictured on the right-hand side of the slide. So that asteroid called Eros, which has a length of about 15 to 20 miles, or what's that? That's about 30 to 40 kilometers. That's an example of a planetesimal. Planetesimals are marked by the beginning of gravity assisting in the growth of the structure. How does this work? Once the planetesimal reaches about a kilometer in size, its mass is large enough that the influence of its gravity extends past its surface. And what that means is that a clump that might otherwise miss the planetesimal, as you see depicted on that top diagram, will instead be pulled in by the planetesimal's gravity, will strike the planetesimal, and will give it a little bit of additional mass. And this means that planetesimals can start to grow faster than was possible for mere clumps. As that growth progresses, the planetesimal starts to get more and more massive, and its mass is going to start to form it into a spherical shape. And when that happens, when the planet, when the structure gets large enough that its gravity pulls it into a spherical shape, that's the final stage, which we call the protoplanet stage. Protoplanets are larger than about a thousand kilometers in size, and you can see another example of a protoplanet that's still left over in the solar system today, which is Ceres. Uh, Ceres is the largest object within the asteroid belt, um, and it's an example of what we call a dwarf planet. Um, so the dwarf planets in our solar system are protoplanets that are left over from the formation process. If you leave it alone, don't collide it with another protoplanet or scatter its orbit or do anything random, eventually a protoplanet has a very good chance of turning into a planet itself. And we can actually watch this process in action, not within our own solar system, but in other solar systems nearby. There's a very powerful radio telescope that's been constructed in South America called ALMA, which has the ability to measure the heat given off by grains of dust. So all of the dust in that protoplanetary disk gets heated up by the parent star and gives off some light. And ALMA can measure that light. And it's created the image that you see on the left-hand side of the slide. Within that image, you see a bunch of concentric rings. The ones near the middle and the yellow part of the image, that's just diffraction, so that's not important. But once you get into the orange and red parts of the image, those rings are real. And as far as we can tell, those are places where planets are actively forming. So there are planetesimals or protoplanets within each one of those rings that are just gobbling up all of the available dust, evacuating their little area within the protoplanetary disk, and preventing the emission of that heat light from the dust. This is one really important piece of evidence that tells us that we're on the right track with the nebular hypothesis. We can see 
the things that we think ought to be happening actually taking place in real star systems. So we've talked in this video about some of the patterns that show up in the solar system, ideas like the planets all orbiting in the same direction and in the same plane, the terrestrial planets being found closer to the Sun than the Jovian planets, and we've talked about our idea for how this comes to be, which we call the nebular hypothesis. Now, you might have guessed from the name nebular hypothesis that this idea is still incomplete. It's a work in progress. It's not the nebular theory, it's the nebular hypothesis. And one big reason for that is because the nebular hypothesis so far doesn't do a great job describing exoplanet systems. And we'll talk about that in class. But we think at least the broad outlines of the nebular hypothesis are correct. So this idea of core accretion, where we build from very small up to very large structures through successive collision and growth, probably works because we've seen it in action in other star systems. Thank you for joining me, and I hope to talk to you again soon for another topic in astronomy.